In 1987, someone interrupted the broadcast of a television station in Chicago. The first interruption was during the news, and the second was during a showing of Doctor Who. What was broadcast was exceedingly mysterious, a touch scary, and the incident has never been resolved. These broadcast signal intrusions became known as the Max Headroom Incident because the broadcaster was wearing a Max Headroom mask and costume. Who was behind? this famous case of television hacking, and how did they manage to do it? Max Headroom was advertised as the first computer-generated TV presenter that debuted on Britain's Channel 4 in a TV movie in 1985. The 1985 movie was adapted to a TV show that ran for two seasons. Over the years, the character appeared as a TV show host, VJ, Coke spokesman, and a talk show guest. However, the character became a true pop culture legend after the Max Headroom signal intrusion that occurred on November 22, 1987. That night, the people of Chicago were treated to a prankster dressed as the famous computer-generated TV presenter. At two minutes, this is considered to be the longest time that an unknown signal hacker was able to showcase his shenanigans on a broadcast channel. In truth, there were two attempts to broadcast Max Headroom. The first one was a quick takeover during a sports broadcast on Chicago's WGN. The intrusion happened at approximately 9.15 p.m. and Dan Roan, a local sportscaster, was just beginning his segment when the TV signal got disrupted. Back then it was normal for the signal to drop on analog TVs from time to time. However, when the signal picked back up, there was Max Headroom in all of his creepy glory. WGN engineers were quick on their feet and were able to take back the signal. What made this intrusion so unnerving is that no sound could be heard from the broadcast. Just this weird, creepy buzzing noise as Max's face bobbed up and down on the screen. Studio engineers made the assumption that the intrusion was an inside job. They went through the building to find the culprit, but there was no one to be found. They eventually discovered that the broadcast was pre-recorded footage that came from an unknown third party at a separate location. The second and more infamous intrusion happened just after 11 p.m. on that same night. This time it was during a broadcast of Doctor Who on WTTW, a public TV station in Chicago. If he wasn't already creepy during the first intrusion, it only got creepier the second time around. Max started singing the theme to Clutch Cargo, a short-lived but popular cartoon that aired between 1959 and 1960. He taunted the WGN channel and their broadcaster Chuck Swirsky. He even proceeded to promote Pepsi, which was strange considering the Max Headroom character was being used to promote Coca-Cola during this time. Max then started flipping the bird to the camera with his middle finger covered in a rubber material. He proceeded to sing the line, Your love is fading from the song I Know I'm Losing You by The Temptations. He hummed random bits and blurted out famous phrases from TV shows. At one point he started screaming nonsensical things before moaning loudly. When he got tired of blabbering, he said, I made a masterpiece for all the greatest world newspaper nerds. Since WGN was being run by the Chicago Tribune during this time, he then held up a glove that was similar to what Michael Jackson wore and said, My brother is wearing the other one, but it's dirty. It's like you got blood stains on it. Before his airtime ended, a woman in a maid's outfit came into the scene and used a fly swatter to spank his naked butt while he screamed, they're coming to get me! After this light BDSM session, he was gone. The Max Headroom signal intrusion baffled authorities and the public. Who was bold enough to pull off something like this on a public channel? The police were involved in the case because the hijacking of a broadcast signal is illegal. It was reported that the pranksters could face up to a year in jail and $100,000 in fines. The second Max Headroom hijacking lasted under two minutes before the signal transmitters got cut off. Authorities discovered that during this time there were no engineers at the WTTW tower. If there had been someone on duty at the time, the intrusion signal would have been stopped even before it started. The broadcast had already ended before anyone from WTTW noticed that anything was wrong. Since no one was actually present in the tower, there are no official copies of the hack from WTTW. Most of the recordings that have surfaced on the internet came from Doctor Who fans who were taping that episode on their VCRs. WGN and WTTW didn't keep the event a secret. They flashed the video on their newscast the next day, dubbing the culprit behind it as a TV video pirate, which amused and confused the people of Chicago. While the viewers found the broadcast hilarious, the government was not amused. The FCC delegated time and manpower to find out who was behind the prank and offered a reward to anyone who could provide them with any information. 
Then FCC spokesman Philip Bradford reminded people that this stunt could lead to jail time and a hefty fine. The WTTW also clarified that while the video may seem amusing to some, it was a clear violation of federal law. The FCC's efforts did result in something. They discovered how the hacker did it. They had placed their very own dish antenna right between the transmitter tower, allowing them access to interrupt the original signal from WTTW. They didn't need expensive equipment. All they needed was good timing and the perfect position of their own antenna to disrupt the signal. The FCC also managed to detect a possible location where the video was taped. Based on the background of the videos, FCC agents determined that it looked like the roll-down door of a warehouse. They found a district in Chicago that had various warehouses with doors similar to the ones in the video. However, they were never able to officially determine who was responsible for the prank. Chicago was abuzz with rumors regarding the identity of the people involved in the Max Headroom incident. Unfortunately, most of these rumors were false and weren't further investigated by authorities. The people behind the prank were determined to remain anonymous and never publicly took credit for the incident. People are still theorizing about who was actually behind it. One of the most popular assumptions is that Eric Fourier was behind all of it. Eric is the creator of Shea St. John, a fictional character that got maimed in a car accident and recreated her body using mannequin parts. Fans of Eric's art project pointed out the similarities between the Max Headroom character and Shea St. John. They think the surreal camera work and the use of masks and low budget prosthetics are way too similar. Which I agree, his videos give off the same unnerving vibe as the Max Headroom signal intrusion. However, those closest to Eric have debunked the theory. He was nowhere near the Chicago area during the time of the Max Headroom incident. They did say that Eric would have been amused by the rumors of his involvement in the incident. The Max Headroom intrusion isn't the only incident of a broadcast signal being hacked. Captain Midnight is considered to be the first hacker who successfully interrupted a broadcast signal with a personal message after he was annoyed at HBO for raising their prices. On April 27, 1986, he hacked into HBO's signal during its airing of The Falcon and the Snowman. Captain Midnight was able to rant for almost 5 minutes before HBO cut off his signal. What seemed to be a minor inconvenience to viewers was actually something very serious for the US government. Authorities realized that there were people who could easily hack into satellites, which posed a risk to the military. A hacker could intercept signals from Navy or spy satellites that were monitoring the Soviet Union at the time. Vital information could be intercepted and state secrets could be compromised. The FCC immediately began investigating the incident. They were overwhelmed by over 200 confessions made by hacking enthusiasts who wanted to take credit for the Captain Midnight intrusion. However, the FCC managed to track down the real hacker. They determined that there was only one specific set of antennas strong enough to overpower HBO's signal. They also found out that the graphics model that was used to render the typeface from the hacking was quite rare. Their investigation led them to John R. McDougall, who was a former operations engineer at an uplink station. At the time, hacking was considered a relatively new crime, so he only had to pay $5,000 in fines, was put on probation, and his amateur radio license was suspended for a year. Less than two years after his conviction, satellite hijacking became a felony to deter further hijackers. And it worked, since there have been very few cases reported since. One of the most recent attempts was in 2007, when viewers of the Playhouse Disney Channel in New Jersey were treated to a few minutes of pornography during the airing of Handy Manny. Another one was in 2009 when the viewers of the Super Bowl in Tucson had the airing of the game interrupted with 37 seconds of pornography. Severe punishments for broadcast hackers are still in place, and now hackers are more easily caught. However, the identity of those behind the Max Headroom incident remain a mystery, and I'm fine with not knowing the answer to who was involved. The prank didn't harm anyone. They didn't force anyone to watch porn or anything obscene like some of the other hacking incidences. I like knowing that someone was able to pull this off, and that we're left still wondering and talking about it today. It makes for a great mystery that will go down in history as one of the coolest mysteries that didn't harm anyone, no one was murdered, nothing bad happened, and it's just a fun one. Strangers. Who do you think was behind the Max Headroom incident? Do you think they deserve to be caught and prosecuted? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, share it, do whatever. Subscribe if you're new, hit the bell button. I really appreciate you watching to the end. And as always, stay strange.